right there. Assalamu alaikum. The way we have this program is uh, three components. First, the will, and Imam Zia is going to be on his way, inshallah. And before that, we for the, for the brothers, Brother Ahmad Khan is going to teach uh, how to wear the ihram. That will be a short one. And uh, <coughs> Hafiz uh, Usman, who is also a lawyer, he is going to talk about the will like he did last time. We have less people because we have live stream today. Did you have to present this? Uh, have some, no. no. Yeah. That one. Oh, you did it in 2010? Give it to the real, real text. While this is pulling up, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. So, some of you were here last time, some of you weren't. Uh, oh, yes, that's not it. Oh, it's a different uh, look. Okay, that's fine. It starts at legal consequences. That's all It's not the same. Do you have the one from last time? It's in the. No, no, no. Hold on. The one I gave you. Assalamu alaikum again. So, I'm going to discuss. Excuse me? Okay. I'm, I'm going to discuss a few important things that we need to keep in mind when writing or planning to write a will. Uh, and before I begin, as always, I'd like to make a disclaimer that uh, all the information that you receive part of this presentation is information only. It's not legal advice. I'm not giving you uh, direct legal advice. Um, and furthermore, okay, and again, this is for uh, focus for people who are going to Hajj. Uh, that's the primary purpose for being presenting here with Hajj Seminar. I have sort of an overview. If you go back yeah, go back a slide. It's kind of a map that I've uh, drawn up, which asks three questions. And I will pretty much keep my discussions within the realm of these three questions, which are why should I write a will? And second question being why people don't. Some of the common reasons why uh, people don't that I come across. And the lastly, how should I go about writing a will? Right, some of the things that we need to consider when writing a will or having someone write a will. Uh, first, first and foremost, why should I write a will? And we'll start with um, we'll start with the the reasons that are in there from the Quran. 
Okay? And many times the Quran mentions that if you have if you have something to bequest, that you should write it down. Okay? Uh, by the reference number here in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 180, that if you have something is prescribed upon you, that when death approaches any of you, if he, if he leaves any goods, that he makes a bequest to parents and next of kin, according to reasonable usage. This is due from those who are mindful of God. So basically he's talking about, this ayah is talking about the believers and Muslims that uh, we should write a will. Uh, and uh, we know from just doing a poll among ourselves that majority of us don't have a will, whether you're going to Hajj or not. Uh, and you can kind of take a poll within yourself whether do you have a will or not. And I know that most of you will say, no, you don't, you don't have it. So that's the reason number one. The reason number two, or the source that we get is from Hadith, which also kind of it says the same thing. It says, it is duty of a Muslim who has anything to bequest not to leave, not to let two nights pass without writing a will about it. Or more generally, writing a contract about it, making a record about it. Uh, clearly, you see emphasis on writing a will or writing, making a document about what, you, what will happen to your things. Uh, clearly you see there is, it's very important, emphasized many, many places uh, in the Qur'an and Hadith. And the reason why it's done is because to eliminate any kind of confusion that people might have after you've passed. So after you've passed, you're not there to tell people what you want done with your things or your kids. So the place to address that is a will, is a last will and testament. Okay. Um, moving on to the next uh, next portion, continuing on the same subject, which why should I write a will? There's some practical considerations that you that you want to you want to keep in mind. Uh, is that you know if something happens to you? What happens to your wealth? What happens to your house, your cars, and bank accounts, investment accounts? What happens to it? Right. Uh, you know, we think about, you know, death in a very abstract way that, yeah, okay, when someone dies, this happens and that happens. But really, if you think about it, sit down and think about it, it's a very tough question to answer. When I meet with clients uh, and, I, and I propose the question to them, so where do you want your things to go? It, you know, it takes them a minute, like, okay, wow, this can happen to me, really? Uh, yes, yeah, it can happen to you, and it will happen to you, just like it happens to everybody. So it's a, it's it's a it's a point, it's a time in your life when you're writing a will for you to stop and think. Okay, what will happen to your things and your children? Uh, question number two, as it poses there, do you care if, who takes care of your children upon your death or sudden death? As I as I put it there, because it can happen suddenly. If you don't have a will, then the person who is appointed as your guardian is someone who is appointed by a court or a judge. Given that you don't have, if neither of the parents is, uh, are present and you have minor children, then you don't have, uh, you, you, you don't have your own choice of who gets to take care of your children or raise them. Uh, so a will is where you write down, okay, this person or this elder or my brother or my sister uh, are the persons who you want your children uh, to be raised by. And, and thirdly, there are legal consequences that you want to keep in mind for not having a will and which we'll turn to next. So these are, uh, there are some consequences or legal consequences and we'll go one in one each. Uh, the first one, the first one is that if you do not have a will, uh, and while I'm talking about it, I want to also kind of uh, dispel a rumor, which I did it last time as well. Most people think that if you don't have a will, that your things or your assets just go to the state. That that does not happen. That's a rumor. That's a myth. It's not real. It's not that if you don't have a will, everything just goes to the court or the state. It doesn't happen. What happens though, if you don't have a will, that your things go to your heirs according to the laws of Texas. 
Okay, the, the distribution rules or the distribution shares are not decided by you, but the state of Texas. Okay, uh, so whatever state law, state law says at that time is what's going to happen to your things, how they're going to be divided. Okay, uh, and then you have to apply to the court to have that happen. Um, there is an exemption which is called the small, small estate exemption. If your if your assets are worth fifty thousand dollars or less at the time of your death, then you can opt to uh, a simple probate process wherein you don't have to involve the court. But that's only a very small exemption. I mean, you can see it's $50,000. If you own that or less, you fall in that category. Otherwise, we go through the uh, court procedure to do that. Uh, second point is that it can be very expensive, right? So if you do, if, let's say, for instance, if someone didn't have a will, and then you, you apply to the court, um, the heirs apply to the court for distribution, then, and if, if there is any kind of contest between the children or any heirs, or if one of the, or one of the relatives comes out and says, well, this person in their lifetime promised me their watch or something. So there is room for challenges that can really add to the cost of uh, of taking this, doing this uh, after your death, right? So if it's it's better to do it first, that way you kind of eliminate all the kind of confusion and you can really reduce all these unnecessary costs that might that might come up. Um, and lastly, I put their uh, immediate distribution. I put an asterisk by that. What that mean? What that means is that. At the time of your passing, if you don't have a will and your children are over the age of majority, then the distribution happens at that time. Most people don't think about it this way. Most people think that, okay, well, if I am, if I am alive and when I pass, well, everything just goes to my spouse. Not always, not in every single case, okay? Uh, so if you don't have a will, then there's a chance that the distribution will have to be done at that time and not at a later time. So if you have a surviving spouse who's going to be around after you're gone, then that will create some uh, serious problems for you. Okay? Because at that time, the heirs, the legal heirs, namely the children, can demand that right and enforcement of that right. Okay, so having a will kind of safeguards that uh, where you can state in your will how and when and what needs to be done uh, at your passing. That's an important uh, thing to notice and make note of. Now, we move on to the second consideration, which is why do people not write a will? Okay, and I have, just through experience, I have come across these, these three reasons, um, and I will talk about each in turn. First one is, it's for the rich people. Okay? Some people have this myth that uh, only people who have a lot of wealth should have a will. Right? Uh, and that, that is completely inaccurate and, and, and erroneous of an assumption, because it's not about how much you are leaving behind. It's about you leaving things behind. Even if you have a small or, 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 a si or a moderate size of estate that you're leaving behind, even that you want to make sure that it goes to your heirs, okay, and to the rightful heirs and not um, either wasted or uh, in some cases, in very limited cases, goes to the state. So whatever you have, you want to make sure that uh, you write it down in the will, so that way it passes to the, uh, to the appropriate heirs after you've passed. Uh, second re reason, and it's kind of a uh, thing I like to call Superman syndrome, that you know that nothing can happen to me, right? Uh, and I'll live here forever. At least that we, we think that we will live here forever. And uh, that's not the case. Uh, I had a, a client of mine who, who, who had gotten married not too long ago. Wife passed away. Everything was in the joint name, you know, joint account, everything in the name of the both husbands and wives. Now, what happened that after one, the, 
the first spouse passed away, the second spouse was left with uh, a house in his name and the wife's name. Now he, he struggled with what to do. Okay? She had no will, so she couldn't, she couldn't have said that, okay, everything that, I, that belongs to me goes to my husband or whatever you, you know, they, they had decided. But death can happen, you know, obviously, as we know, to anyone at any time. So it's best to prepare for that uh, than to be sorry about it. Uh, and the second, the third reason why people think people don't do it is they think it's too complicated or it's too expensive. Uh, well, neither is correct uh, as, uh, as I'll demonstrate uh, just next. So these are the things that you want to, oh, the, the, this is now the third question that we were on, how to go about it, how to write a will, or what things to consider when writing a will. So these are some of the things that you want to think about when writing a will. And we will talk about each of them uh, turn by turn, but I'm, I'm going to emphasize on some of them more than others because of their importance. Uh, we go to the second, uh, the, next, the next slide. And the first thing that we want to do is we want to select an executor. A lot of people kind of, uh, well, a lot of people don't know what executor means. So I'll, I have a small, uh, brief definition there. Individual responsible for distributing your assets. It's, it's important to know that um, these, this uh, executor can be an heir, but does not have to be. Okay? It can be any, any, any adult over the age of 18. It is also important to know that this person, this executor, doesn't necessarily inherit from you. Okay? Just because he or she is an executor does not mean he's going to inherit. So if, if uh, you have a situation where you cannot name an, an heir as an executor, you don't need to worry about him, him uh, sort of inheriting because he's not a beneficiary or, or heir. He's just doing the job or duties of an ex executor, meaning managing. He's a manager of the will, if you... Um, uh, that's the way. To, uh, that's the way to kind of think about it. And point number three, or C, I've got there. You know that executor should be trustworthy, common sense, Muslim and local. Um, you want it. One point. Uh, you want it to be local because, as I mentioned last time, that if something were to happen to you, you don't want to pick your brother or sister who's in Pakistan or India or across the oceans, because you want that person to be on the ground. If something happens to you, you want him to be right here and ready to go, okay? Uh, or at least maybe a flight away, maybe in North America. So what I advise to my clients is to pick someone who, who can be here without the need of a visa, okay? So if they're going to sit and stand in line to get a visa, then they're not the right uh, appropriate executor of your will. Uh, moving on to the next uh, slide, we have heirs. So the next thing that you want to think about is identifying all of your heirs, your rightful heirs, which includes your spouse, uh, children, parents, siblings, and other relatives. Um, the next, this is kind of self-explanatory. So the next one is you want to identify all of your assets. So it's one thing to not have a will, right? It's, one, it's the other, it's probably sometimes worse, to not have identified all of your assets in the will. So, so... Even, even though you have a will, there can be still things that may go fall outside of the will if you haven't identified them inside the will, in the document. Okay? So it's important to have all of your assets, um, you know, let it be real estate, businesses, investment accounts, whatever you own, stock bonds, you want to include them uh, and somehow identify them that way you know that it's there. Okay? And nothing kind of uh, passes through or goes through under the Texas law, the distribution is, uh, when, as far as the distribution is concerned. That's the item number three. Number four is that you want to list all of your liabilities as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Next one is liabilities. And as I mentioned last time, that having liability, liabilities mentioned is kind of helps you keep track of what do you owe on? Okay, so if you have a house, and these are some of the things I mentioned last time, 
If you have a house, it's fine. But if you have business interests that the other spouse may not be aware of, you want to make sure that that, that is included in the will. So the obligations on, for example, a, a rental property or um, a student loan or business loan can be met every single month. Okay, If one spouse was the one who managed everything, then you want to make sure that, that there's a record of that somewhere. Other, uh, first, I mean, you want to make sure you, your wife knows about what you're doing or your husband knows that you're, what you're doing. But if, you, if they don't, then this is the right place to put it and make, make note of it and make an official record of it. La, uh, next item is um, your f funeral arrangements. And there, basically, what you want to take in, con into consideration is that maybe you may have prepaid your expenses, bought the land or leased you know, the land where you'd like to be buried, uh, you know, other funeral expenses. If you have prepaid them, mention that in your will. Because you may have done it, but there may not be any record, or they, no one, other people who are around after your death may not know about it, right? So they may pay twice. Once you, when you paid in your lifetime, and then your executor, who may not be your wife, okay, uh, then they may, you know, you may t pay twice. So this is, a, this is a place where you put, I've paid prepaid expenses, this is so-and-so company, and here's a, you know, we may even attach a document or a receipt or something to that. So that's a very important thing to notice, uh, to note there. You want to also want to make sure that you include the Islamic burial rites, which is like the rituals. Uh, there are certain things that you don't want done unless they're, you know, um, they are required by law, like autopsy and on all, all things, other things that are prohibited in our, in our religion. Uh, so you want to make sure you have uh, all that in there. And last point, which kind of a subtle point, is the transportation of body. Would you like your body to be transported after your death? Or would you like to be buried wherever you are? That's an important decision that you have to make now, right? Not when something has happened. Okay? Um, next slide talks about power of attorney. Power of attorney, as I mean, most of us know, know, know what it is. It allows the other spouse or any other family member, whoever you assign as your agent, it allows them to take action on your behalf. It kind of accelerates the process of them taking legal action on your behalf. Okay? Although your spouse is, can do pretty much all the things that you can, even though, for example, if you have a joint business account, your spouse has just as much right as yourself. Uh, but not everything is cut and clear. I mean, there are other things that uh, maybe a brokerage account that, which only may you, you may have your name on there, but your wife may not. So if she has a power of attorney, she can close, she can have, uh, have them distribute uh, the, the funds out of the account. So for all those things that, uh, that you may not own jointly, power of attorney will come in very, very handy. Um, and, and to have um, uh, to be able to do like uh, to able to accelerate and uh, the process. And as it says, as the second point, it is active immediately, meaning that you know you don't have any delays or you don't have to wait for a court order in order for it to become live. Um, so that's that's the advantage of uh, the power of attorney. Next, what we're going to go to is basically common questions. Okay. I've kind of went through the first three questions, you know, uh, why should I write a will, why people don't, and how to go about it. These are common questions that I just get from, from people, okay? Uh, and uh, I'll go through each of them and answer them, and then we'll, uh, we'll open the floor for some Q&A. The first question is, is the Sharia is Sharia compliant will, meaning a will that that has Islamic, that has distribution according to the laws of Islam, is it valid in the state of Texas? Okay, and the answer is yes, absolutely yes. Okay, you can write anything that you want in the will as long as it's not illegal or against any laws of Texas. Okay, so 
you may not write in your will that, you know, after I die, sell my house and, you know, do money laundering or, or do anything, any other illegal activities. Well, that part of your will is illegal and invalid and void, okay? Because it's, it's not legal uh, to, do, to do those activities. But whatever is, val uh, whatever is legal as part of your will is 100% is valid. Um, and there's no law says that any religious any distribution according to the religious um, beliefs, they're all 100% valid. Second question, can I give my wealth to anyone? Answer is yes and no. You can, there's a certain level of, uh, a certain percentage of your wealth that you can give away. Islamically, up to one third of your estate you can give away in either charity or gift or whatever. Anything, other, anyone other than your heirs, legal heirs, up to one third, you can give that away. The rest of it has to go through, uh, has to go to your legal heirs or or your descendants, wife and children, mainly. Mainly. Next question: Can I disinherit my heirs? Well, can you dis inherit your uh, disinherit your children? The answer, according to the Texas law, is yes. You may disinherit your, you know, your children. You you might you may think that you know your your sons are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, haven't finished college, haven't got a job, bums, and you know you, you want nothing to do with them and they want nothing to do with you, you can disinherit them, according to Texas law. According to Islamic law, the answer is completely opposite. You may not disinherit your, your children. Okay. Uh, wife is a little bit tricky. And according to Texas law, you may not disinherit your wife. Or... Vice versa. I mean, the the wife may not disinherit the husband. Now, the better, more appropriate term is a spouse. You cannot um, disinherit your spouse legally and Islamically. Next question is that uh, does it have to be recorded? And the answer is no. It does not have to be recorded or registered. The will does not have to be recorded anywhere in any registers. Uh, how long does it take to make a will? Depending on how complex the will is, but anywhere five, five days to about a week is how long it takes uh, to write a will, given that, given that you provide all the necessary information to the attorney or whoever is preparing your will, or if you're doing it yourself. You, know, you want to make sure you gather all the things that I mentioned, uh, identifying your heirs, identifying your assets, liabilities, all those things. So roughly about, about a week to complete that. Um, as far as the last thing, cost is concerned, I, I shared with the group last time, there are two, basic two options to write a will, um, which are these. The option number one is will review form. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you have a will reviewed by an attorney, then that's, that's basically the breakdown of that. You download and fill out the form. Go back, please. You download and fill out the form. You have a consultation of about 30 minutes. Uh, and then your, your will is read for, uh, it, you know, it's complete will review for validity and notarization. And so that's approximate cost is what you're looking at. If you download a, like a template or a form, <clears throat> fill, out your, fill it out yourself and contact me and, uh, and we do the consultation. Option number two, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a will draft. Basically, it's a, uh, a will that is drafted by by myself or yeah, by myself. I, these are only my my fees, not anybody else. Uh, and you know, you have a, an hour one-on-one -on -one consultation, power of attorney, and then notarization. So that's the fee for that. So that kind of general answer to your how much how much does it cost question. Uh, next, we have Q and A. Q &A. So I'd like to turn it over to you for any specific, uh, but not so tricky questions. Uh, no questions about, you know, second wives and things like that. Oh yes. Uh, if if your executor, okay. As long as the executor understands all the the rights of Islam and, and what needs to be followed. If you trust that person, 
to do whatever you think is is right Islamically, then by all means, okay. But we find that in 90% of the cases, or even more, you, you're gonna want someone who's Muslim because they will understand what happens as far as uh, the funeral and, and all that, all those things. So, yes. Yes. So can we compensate the daughter from that 30% like give her some from that 30% first and then remain the wife by that rule? Sure. So I'll repeat the question if, if everybody did everybody hear that question clearly? Okay. Well, I'll repeat it for people who are maybe behind glass, glass doors. The question was, Islamically you can gift up to one third to anyone you wish. Okay, that's what I mentioned earlier. She's mentioning the daughters or the females get twi uh, twice as less as the, as the male children. So her question was, can you compensate the daughters uh, out of that one-third? And the answer is no, you may not. Okay, because that would be showing favorism according to you. Right? You will be showing favorism to one child over the other. So you may not, uh, you may not give them twice. Which you or may not do anything that will increase their share um, more than that what is they're entitled to. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So it depends on your again your situation. Okay. Who is around at the time? Okay, if if only the children are there, then the distribution is different. So it depends on the re remaining surviving heirs at the time, and that's how the Texas law applies. Okay, and, and also depends on whether there are uh, different marriages. Maybe if there are kids from different marriages, then the rules are different. I'm talking about sure. Yes. So there, there, are, there are actually a charts where, where you can, I'll, I'll send you a link to that. It's a complicated chart that you look at, and that kind of tells you what, who goes what. So, and, it, and it depends on whoever is the surviving heir at the time of your death, uh, which determines who gets what. Yeah. Correct. Um, the question was, can you name an executor or a guardian, excuse me, a guardian of your minor children, someone who is not in the U.S.? Um, legally speaking, yes, you may. There's no legal restriction uh, that someone has to be in the U.S. or has to be uh, a resident of U.S. There's no restriction like that. Now, practically, though, that's a completely different question. Would you want someone, someone living in Pakistan to take care of children who may not even be able to come here? Right? So if something happens to you or both of you, parents, and you named your brother who lives in Lahore or Karachi, well, they can't be here or they can't come here. Then what's, what will happen to your children then? They'll have two options. Well, one option, really. They will have to, if they're minor, they'll have to then move to, move to Pakistan. Right? Oh, right. I'm talking about if the guardian is there, if for the, for the guardian to take care of them, they will have to move to Pakistan in order to live there and wherever wherever they're from. Sure. Yeah, the state of Texas has uh, no say in where, what happens to the kids. They're, they're fine as long as obviously they're uh, they're not abused and things like that. But that's a different issue. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, but not recommended at all. Sure. To who take care of them here? Exactly. Yeah. So that's a, it's a tough it's a tough situation, but that's something that you want to talk to your your spouses about and figure out a solution. Either someone who's close to your 
um, maybe, I mean, then at, at that point, then the option may be to send them back to Pakistan for a period of time, right? Until they become, uh, they turn 18 or whatever the age you decide and have them come back. So that's something that you want to discuss and have a discussion about with your wife. Um, so, question in the back? Could you repeat that question? Right. No, they don't have to go. Absolutely not. Absolutely, it's a kid's choice. But sure, absolutely, it's kid's choice. If he's minor and he doesn't want to go to Pakistan, the question was whether, whether uh, should he get someone who is in Pakistan to do that? And the answer was, yes, you can, no problem. But should you? That's that's a different question. And yes, and the kids, it's it's their choice. If they don't want to leave, then they can here and like as he mentioned, uh, foster care or something, uh, you know, of that arrangement may have to be made. Uh, last question. Okay. What about it? Okay, uh, some countries have, uh, you know, you can have reciprocal acceptance of legal documents. So you will have to check with wherever your properties are, whether they will accept a will that is executed, validly executed in the U.S., whether they'll accept that document. Okay, so you'll have to check with the, the recipient country, right? Uh, as far as, I mean, there are other tax implications, which we won't go through this is beyond discussion of this topic, uh, this presentation, but there are some other tax issues, implications that you might consider having property. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, <coughs> Here's what we're going to do, inshallah. Um, Brother Ahmad is going to teach the ihram, the etiquettes of ihram, how to